Hello and a very warm welcome to our webinar. It goes out to our customers, students, power electronic engineers, and last but not least, to our competition. My name is Stefan Häuser. I'm your moderator for today's webinar with the title Push the Limits of Efficiency and Power Density for EV Charger Converters. Electrification in the vehicle market is obviously the next big thing in power electronics, bigger than anything that I've seen in the last two decades. It is not only about the electric vehicles themselves, but also about the charging infrastructure. So DC fast chargers are a key to offer a solution for today's limitations in range and also the acceptance uh, of, general, of electric vehicles in general, especially for longer distances. Your presenter today is Emilio Meza. He's the product marketing manager for energy storage, solar and EV charging applications at Semicron. Emilio holds a degree in electrical engineering from Texas A&M University and an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. Emilio has been with Semicron for eight years, beginning as a project manager for power electronic stacks in the US. And he later moved into sales before joining the product marketing here in our headquarters in Germany last year. So enjoy the webinar. Emilio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stefan. So um, to get started here, let's look at some of the background for the EV charging world. Um, instead of looking at the overall market and saying how much it's going to grow over the coming years, I wanted to really focus on one certain aspect of the market. And that's really the, the growth in bi-directional charging. So what we've seen is California is the US state that's really setting global energy trends. And one of the biggest focuses for California for the charging world right now is B2G or vehicle to grid. So this is a major request by the California Energy Commission um, really as a method to help stabilize the grid. And the California Energy Commission is really um, the body which, which puts those grants and money towards the projects which can help achieve California's goals. And there's also um, some 12 US states that are adopting much of California's zero emissions or low emissions uh, voltage, uh, vehicle initiatives. So that leads me to believe that bi-directional power flow will be something certainly much bigger in the future of the charging world. Um, and so as we look at the bi-directional power flow for EV charging, the typical, typical topology that we're seeing is the bi-directional PFC and the dual active bridge for the DC to DC. And as we look at these chargers, there's three facets that stick out the most. So we know that the manufacturers want a very power dense design, a very efficient and a very low cost design. Power density because of course these chargers need to fit in a very small area, sometimes right in the parking lots and the parking spaces where the, charge, where the cars need to charge. And at the same time, in order to reduce the amount of time that it takes for a vehicle to charge, we need to increase the power. One way, of course, is increasing the voltage. Um, that way that we can maintain low current, keep those cables as small as possible. So really, we're seeing about 950 volts um, maximum. Um, if that goes higher, we'll, you know, to be dis determined at this point. And then for efficiency, of course, if there is a lower efficiency system, you're basically dealing with, um, with waste heat, which means more cooling, more cost. But on top of that, um, you know, really, it's about trying to get the the cost where it needs to be. Uh, so we're trying to reduce car the the overall system cost as much as as much as possible. Um, this is obvious for the business case, which must make sense. And the EV charging world is going towards a, a high volume, low cost market. So cost really will be a big focus here. And as we look at these three factors of the charger system and the power electronics, there are three components that have the biggest effects. The control boards will most likely be the same. Much of the, much of the passive components will be about the same. However, the magnetics, the heat sink, and the power modules will be some of the biggest um, factors effect affecting volume, efficiency, and cost. So from the magnetic side, we know that if we increase the switching uh, frequency, we can reduce the inductance, and this leads to the volume and the cost reduction. From the heat sink, similar concept, we're trying to reduce the heat sink as much as possible, which reduces cost and which reduces volume. However, 
as we're decreasing the heat sink, we will run into some problems about cooling the power modules. And then lastly, the power modules. So as we try to increase the switching frequency to reduce the magnetics, we are seeing a shift towards silicon carbide chips, which allow this faster switching with reduced losses. And of course, the package which these chips go, go into, it must be optimized for very low thermal resistance. So Simicron has now introduced the Semitop E1, E2 portfolio. Um, looking at the, the charging topology, we will see an active front end, a DC to DC primary and secondary. So this is a pretty typical topology that we see, um, especially for a bi-directional converter with this dual active bridge. And of course you could go different paths here. You could go with multi-level, you could go you know, different chip setups, but from a, an ease of analysis standpoint, a two level silicon carbide approach works pretty well here. So we needed to come up with a portfolio that had, a, that had all of the topologies that we require for this charging topology. And therefore we've come up with the Semitop E1 and E2 with full silicon carbide using generation three 1200 volt silicon carbide MOSFETs. <clears throat> and the Semitop E1 and E2 are very low commutation inductance packages down to about four nanohenry. Henry. Um, and on top of that, on the DBC itself, we have the Kelvin source and temperature sensors included for all the modules here. So the current ratings for this portfolio go from about 40 amps all the way up to 250 amps. In the Semitop E1, we have a six pack, an H bridge and a half bridge. And then in the Semitop E2, we have half bridges going up the rest of the way to 250 amps. The way that we do this is basically paralleling chips inside the devices. So we start with a 32 milliohm, and then as we parallel it, this comes down to 16 milliohm all the way down to 5.3 milliohm. And for all of these devices, they are multi-source compatible. What this means is that the pinout is um, similar to other pinouts of other silicon carbide modules. So that if you have a requirement for multiple sourcing, this can satisfy that requirement to help ease the supply chain safety. <clears throat> and there is one device that you will see down here at the bottom. This is a 250 amp half bridge in the Semitop E2. And you'll notice that the pinout, we have two versions, the multi-source and the easy paralleling pinout. So let's take a further look at that. All right, so in the original multi-source compatible pinout, the focus here is low inductance. So we are really trying to put the chips where they need to be in order to reduce the inductance as much as possible. In this case, down to about four nanohenry. Henry. Um, because we are lining the silicon carbide chips up, this does not necessarily make the, the, the pinout for reaching these chips very optimal. So you'll see that there are DC plus, DC minus, AC, and the gate pins are rather scattered throughout the module. So instead of only going this direction, Simicron has come out with an additional pinout. So we have what we're calling a board optimized pinout. And as you can see on the bottom here, this is really a clear separation between the AC, DC minus, and DC plus, along with the gate driving pins. So this really helps for paralleling to reach higher power or really for the PCB layout in general to try to simplify it as much as possible. For instance, if we take a, a look at three devices in parallel, and we can see that there's the, the clear separation of, the, of the, uh, the connection points. In this case, you have DC plus and DC minus right next to each other. This allows for a very low DC link inductance. So you can have a DC link very um, um, you know, off to the side, and then basically have an overlapping DC plus, DC minus to, to reduce this inductance. And then of course the driving pins are all lined up and the AC output pins are all on one side. Therefore you can have your copper lays and not have to worry about trying to get gate pins somewhere in the middle of a, of a large copper lay. So this is how we were trying to really simplify the paralleling of modules as much as possible. That way, if you are taking one device and trying to, to parallel it, you certainly can to reach higher power. And then I had also mentioned um, things like the Kelvin source pin. So 
though we make a schematic that looks very simple with a MOSFET, um, there's actually a little bit more happening here when we're switching the, the chips on and off. So typically, as we're using silicon carbide, this leads to a larger DIDT and DVDT. So let's take a look first at the DIDT feedback. So the MOSFET itself is being driven by, we'll call this a, an ideal driver, voltage driver. So ultimately, we're trying to put a voltage from gate to, to source, so VGS here. And this um, VGS is affected by a couple things as we have a high DIDT. This inductor here, this LS, if we are connecting to, a, to, the, to the source on the other side of this inductor, that means as we have a, a large DIDT, that there is now a voltage across this inductor. So this VGS sitting here is now the, the, um, the driving voltage minus some voltage here that we're having because of DIDT. So LS times DIDT. And because if you were sl switching very slow and we didn't have a large DIDT, this typically wouldn't matter. But because that exists, if we also have a relatively high inductance, we now have our, our, our VGS, which is actually driving the MOSFET, it will be something lower than the driver during a, during a, a turn off, or I'm sorry, turn on, and then something higher during turn off. And what this does is basically has a, uh, a spike. So when it's turning off, the spike could turn the, the MOSFET back on and vice versa. So that's something we're certainly trying to get rid of. In order to combat this, we basically have what's called a Kelvin source pin. So we, we have this pin that goes directly out to the, to, the, um, to the driver for driving, and we basically bypass this LS inductance. So that's how we really um, allow the, the IDT to continue to, to speed it up, and we're not limited here by this, by this inductance. As we look at the DVDT, so this, this inductance at the bottom here is not so much of a concern anymore. However, we do have what's called a Miller capacitance. So as we are turning on and turning off, if we have a DVT, we do need to, to charge uh, this, this capacitor. So we'll have some current flowing. So in the, in the turn on uh, instance, current will flow from the driver out to the MOSFET. And in the turn off, it will flow back and sink down to the, to the driver. So therefore, this, this VGS in a turn on event will be something less than the driver. And in fact, during the large DVDT, we could have what's called a Miller plateau, meaning that basically all the power is going from the driver to charge this capacitor, not really allowing much, um, really any other power to turn the MOSFET on or off. So this is one of the limiting factor as well for, um, for really turning chips on and off as quickly as possible. If we were spending time in that Miller plateau to charge and discharge this capacitor, that means that that time is not given to, to actually turning the chip on and off. So the way that we really combat this is really down to chip selection. We need to make sure that we select a chip that has a very low capacitance here that we can then switch very, very quickly um, and not have to worry about charging and discharging this. So then it's a question of how do we increase power density? So some of the bigger um, aspects of power density um, is really volume. At the, at the same power, how can we reduce the volume as much as possible? And two things that we can take into consideration here. When we're looking at um, switching frequency, we know that the, that the inductor volume decreases as we increase switching frequency, but also the DC link volume um, decreases as well with an increase in switching frequency. However, you'll see from these, from these charts here that as we increase the switching frequency, there's a point where it starts to flatten out on both of these curves. And this point, you know, for these specific curves, about 100 kilohertz. So after about 100 kilohertz, that means that we are increasing the switching frequency still, which means that we are increasing the amount of silicon carbide that we're using in each module, and um, that no longer makes sense. So that's one thing to always keep in mind of switching faster is not always 
the best option. Um, it's it should be taken into consideration if the if the volume stops decreasing, that's a pretty good sign to stop using more silicon carbide. Otherwise, the payback just isn't there anymore. So of course, these curves may vary depending on if you have you know material or technology advances. Um, this could uh, maybe adjust left or right for the switching frequency for your specific uh, components. So always something to keep in mind. And then as we, as we are trying to increase our switching frequency as much as possible, um, that's when we start to look at which devices would make the most sense. So for a 25 kilowatt type um, charger application, um, ideally we want to go to 100 kilohertz, but of course anything um, higher is better. So I took a look here and, and said, what can we do at say 50 kilohertz? Um, so as a comparison from silicon to silicon carbide. So the first one that, that we had taken a look at here is a Semitop E1. This is a six pack. So all six um, switches are in a single device. And this is using the high performance thermal paste. So trying to make it as even as possible with the silicon carbide approach. And we're able to get to about 15 kilohertz switching frequency. Um, and this is about 690 watts loss. So 98.62% efficiency. Um, beyond this point, um, I was not really able to go much further because um, the, the chips themselves were actually getting too hot. And by the way, um, for all of these simulations, um, this is using the latest SimiCell 5, um, which our silicon carbide devices are available on that um, simulation software. And these are be ru being run at a power factor of minus one, um, just trying to look at the, the AC to, to DC side. So we can reach about 15 kilohertz before we max out our, our temperatures. What if we were trying to go all the way up to that 50 kilohertz mark with regular silicon? Well, I tried and tried, but we had to go to a different device. We actually, I had to step this up to about a Semitrans 3. This is a 200 amp half bridge. So in fact, I put one here, we would need three of these to run at 50 kilohertz. And this is even using the 12F4 chip, which is a very fast switching chip. On top of that, at 50 kilohertz, we're seeing about almost 2,500 watts loss. So the efficiency comes down pretty drastically to 95.18% efficiency. So if you're trying to, um, to come at a very low cost, of course, silicon is typically less expensive than silicon carbide. However, in this situation, you're using so much silicon in a very large package and three packages that the costs start to be, uh, not make a lot of sense here. And then we looked at the silicon carbide. So this again, a semi-top E1, so the smaller package, with a six pack inside using the high performance thermal paste. And at 50 kilohertz, and you'll see that there's not too much of a change going from about you know, 10 or 12 kilohertz all the way up to about 50 kilohertz, um, we're seeing about 367 watts loss. So this is over 99% efficient for the AC to DC design. Therefore, you can see that there's either a, a much higher uh, switching frequency that you can use going from silicon to silicon carbide, or at 50 kilohertz, a much, much, much more efficient system. So then let's look more at the, at the semi-top itself. So we know that we want to reduce the thermal resistance as much as possible. And so this is going from the, from the chips to the heat sink. And we have a few ways of doing this here. So this is actually an industrial standard power module. Um, as I mentioned, this is good for, for second sourcing, um, supply chain safety. However, we tried to, to optimize our device as much as possible within that scope. And one, one thing to look at here, um, the semi-top is using the DBC. So this is the ceramic. And these chips are, are soldered down to this ceramic, which then gets mounted to the heat sink. And rather than using a flat DBC, once you mount that down, if you have a flat DBC, the, the inside can actually come up a little bit collecting thermal paste in one location and actually increasing the thermal resistance if you put too much pressure down. So instead of doing that, we still want to use a lot of mounting pressure as much as possible to really um, reduce the thermal resistance. However, we have also um, optimized the DBC geometry. That way, when we put the two screws on each side, it bends as needed 
so it's flat against the heat sink. So this allows an even spreading of the thermal interface material. And then it comes down to how do we distribute that pressure? And that comes to the housing. So even though two screws are used, this is a hard housing that applies pressure throughout the entire um, area of the semi-top power module. So it really spreads the spreads the uh, the pressure across the DVC. And so again, with the DVC not, not coming up and allowing for more pressure, this allows for a higher um, thermal conductivity. So compared to the conventional design, we're seeing about 20% lower thermal resistance, and this is only with standard thermal paste. Um, so this is allowing more margin for, you know, say a smaller heat sink or, or uh, more efficiency here. And then talking about the thermal paste itself. So with our semi-tops, we pre-apply thermal pastes. Um, so this is an option that I highly recommend. Um, so this, this comes with high performance thermal paste, um, which, you know, at that point, it makes sense because it's 25% lower thermal resistance compared to, say, the conventional TIM type design. And on top of that, Simicron has been printing quite a bit of, of modules, about 2 million every year. And of course, with this, um, with this service, we also have supporting accessories available. So because this is a press fit type design, um, you need a way to press this together without affecting the, the paste pattern on the bottom. Therefore, we also have a tool which basically has, um, this is a metal tool which has holes where that paste sits that you can then apply the pressure to this tool to push the semi top into the PCB board. And then on top of that, for a, for a logistics standpoint, we also have the caps and things so that we can protect the thermal interface material um, in the assembly line so it doesn't get contaminated by dust or particles floating in the air. <clears throat> All right. So then we're looking at the heat sink volume. So there's a, there's a balance between the volume and the thermal resistance. Um, really, this comes down to the amount of aluminum or the amount of, of material that you have inside of a heat sink. And it, um, it makes sense. If you have a larger heat sink, you have more area to, to push the heat through, and you can have uh, better thermal resistance. However, with that larger heat sink, you're also, um, you, you're, you have a higher volume, meaning that your power density goes down, and you also are paying for more material. So ideally, you want to have the smallest heat sink possible to to increase the power density, but this really depends on the power module that you're using. So on the right here, using that, uh, that same six pack, the SK40, uh, where we have our semi-top E1 with all six switches inside, um, this is a simulation showing the, the maximum output power depending on the thermal resistance from sink to ambient. So as we move from left to right, you can see that if we have an extremely good thermal resistance, so we're looking at 0.1 Kelvin per watt, we could achieve maybe a, an output power of, of say 25 kilowatts. And by the way, this is, a, this is a, a, the same as earlier at 50 kilohertz here. And then as we move upwards towards say 0.7 um, Kelvin per watt, this is allowing our heat sink to get smaller and smaller. However, you can see that our, our power is also coming down just under 15 kilowatts. So this is the balance that, that you have to work with, that um, you basically want to reduce the heat sink as much as possible. Um, and especially, you know, as, as you can see that the, the thermal resistance is, is um, uh, very, very much dependent on the volume. Uh, so lower the thermal resistance, but you get a, a much higher price. And for the higher thermal resistance, reduce the output power with the same devices. So then it comes down to cost. Okay, it's, this is great when, when we have a very small, very efficient design, but what happens when we have, you know, our, our cost is too high, the business case no longer makes sense. So we need to make sure that we also keep an idea of the costs here. So for the magnetics and for the heat sink that we're looking at here, um, what, is, what is the relative cost? So as we move from left to right for the magnetics, you can see that from about 16 kilohertz up to about 32 kilo kilohertz, um, the, the cost decline, so from about 100% down to about 70%. So there is certainly a cost decline, 
for these magnetics. And then further, from that to about 48 kilohertz, the cost declines to about 60%. So not quite half, but it's approaching that, that level. So this is a nice 50 kilohertz range that we can use. And then further up, you'll start to see a flattening. And the same goes for the heat sink, that at a very, very low R theta, we have a relatively high cost. But as we increase this, the cost comes down. And then at some point, much like the magnetics, there's a flattening. So we reach about 60% or so, and then it flattens out. It becomes much, much more difficult to really reduce the cost as we increase our R theta. So the payback at that point, once the cost flattens out, um, no longer makes sense. And then we have silicon carbide itself. We know that some years ago, um, there were a lot of predictions about how low silicon carbide would be, and we never were able to meet those predictions given the time period. So we took that and we said, well, what actually happened in silicon carbide world? So since 2015, we've seen a couple generational changes in the silicon carbide chips, which have led to quite a few um, cost changes. So silicon carbide is actually making a lot more sense now, especially as we're able to reduce the, the size and weight of the other components at high switching frequencies. So then it's the question of, of how many chips should we use for silicon carbide. So this is really um, depending on the power output that you're using and the switching frequency. So say that you have found a nice switching frequency for the heat sink and the magnetics that could be around you know, 50 kilohertz or so. And at that point, you're trying to determine um, how modular to make your system. So I basically have three options here that as, um, as possibilities with the number of chips inside. So we know that the, the semi-top itself is highly dependent on the, on the chip cost. So most of that goes towards the silicon carbide. The package itself is relatively low. So if we have our smaller E1 package, we could have a, um, a six pack. So this has a maximum output power going up to about 20, 25 kilowatts or so at low switching frequencies, and then starts to come down. So then if we start to need more like 50 kilowatts at 50 kilohertz, we may be able to get away with a semi-top E1 as a half bridge. So using three of these to make a, um, an AC to DC uh, inverter or uh, converter here. But then above this, if we start to need much, much higher power, especially at much higher switching frequencies, then we might need to graduate to the semi-top E2 half bridge. So this would also give a lot more margin. So I will say here that um, when I was doing these simulations, the maximum junction temperature I gave was 150 degrees Celsius. And I would say that's not necessarily something that we would recommend for, for um, general designs because you want some margin. Basically, as we have this temperature going up, that means that your lifetime is most likely going down. So I would say 120, 125 degrees Celsius would probably be a much, a much um, more appropriate number to use. So then all of these would actually shift down a little bit more based on the 125 degrees Celsius. So that's really um, what we're looking at here from a power perspective. Um, and then it comes down to manufacturing. So, you know, as you're looking at the manufacturing costs, um, there's differences between power modules and TO devices. And um, I'll say that most of my experience is with the power module side, so I can't really speak too much about the TO devices. However, I do know that there are some things to keep in consideration. Um, you have to focus on the isolation, how you're cooling them, and how you're mounting them. So these things are all taken care of inside the power module. We basically have the isolation handled by the, the ceramic. We have the mounting, which is two screws down to the heat sink. And we have an easy um, either press fit or soldering type connection to the PCB. So with the press fit set up, um, of course, this does take some capital cost for the press fit assembly, but then you have a fast automated assembly process. So your labor costs also can come down quite a bit. But then these same press fit devices can also be soldered. I know that soldering is certainly a requirement for a lot of our customers. So we needed to make sure that, um, of course, the whole size may change. And I highly recommend that if you have any questions about whole sizes or how to solder these, we have some, some good um, documentation in our technical explanations and in our mounting procedures. Of course, you can also email us directly and we can work with you to make sure that the, the um, soldering process you're using are also um, good to go. And then on top of that, 
if you are in need of a solder specific pin, so not a press fit pin, but a solder specific pin, um, these are possible on request. So we have be, um, begun using these in the semi-top devices. However, we have not really reached the point of, of putting them into mass production. So we are only handling select uh, products with this uh, solder specific pin. And I didn't really go into the DC DC today, but in summary, I'll say that um, ideally we're looking for a low volume and efficient design, which silicon carbide enables this higher um, uh, efficiency by reducing the switching losses. And the volume of the heatsink and the cap capacitors and the magnetics um, do shrink. Um, the volume shrinkage typically happens um, up to about 100 kilohertz. And then after that point, it, typically you start to lose your payback. And then from a cost perspective, from the heat sink, the magnetics, that may go up to about 50 kilohertz, and then you'll start to see more of an impact in, in cost. And when it comes to our silicon carbide portfolio, we have the Semitop E1, E2 industrial standard modules um, available in six pack H bridge and half bridge type designs. So again, these do incl include the isolation, the thermal sensor, and that Kelvin source um, pin that I had mentioned. And then lastly, silicon carbide is becoming more competitive. Um, it's still at that point where it is more expensive than silicon, that's for sure. However, we're starting to see more and more applications, and EV charging is certainly one of them, where silicon carbide is starting to make a lot more sense once those priorities are in mind. But then the last question is exactly how much does silicon carbide cost? And unfortunately, that's not something I can directly tell you in this webinar. So I have to ask you, if you're, if you're interested, um, please do reach out to, to Simicron directly and ask for a quote and give us a, give us an idea of the volume that you're after and we can work with you on the cost that you need so that's all i had for today emilio thank you very much for that presentation um i will share now actually the the slide set as a pdf so you will see um there's now a file underneath the the chat window where you can download um the slide set and we also have received some questions actually, not so many, so your explanation must have been pretty good. Right. Um, nevertheless, I encourage the audience to send us questions if you have any. Um, the ones that we got, uh, one question is, um, is there any specific flatness surface condition um, to be used with a high performance thermal paste? Um, between the high performance thermal paste and the regular thermal paste, I believe we have the, the same, um, the same uh, heat sink uh, specifications, but that's one thing that we do have in the in the mounting explanations. Um, we do give an idea of the step and the and everything that's involved with the heat sink. I don't know that off the top of my head, but of course we have the in the in the documentation. So if you need more details on that, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, so documentation is there and can be. Can be, I guess, even downloaded from the internet. Yes. Um, what substrate is used in the semi-top uh, products that you've shown? Uh, so the substrate is an aluminum oxide. Um, and I'll say that with the, with the improvements that we've made with the semi-top, I know that we could have gone with different substrates like aluminum nitride or some of the others. However, it didn't really make sense um, for us to, to really go that extra step and spend, those, um, spend the extra money on that. Um, with the with the R theta that we have from the semi top itself and the high performance thermal paste, it it's you know reaching that point where it's pretty pretty similar. Okay, so it's it's all about module um, optimization and thermal paste optimization. Absolutely, that's yeah. it. Okay, cool. Um, I think you have mentioned actually the the inductance of the um, semi top E two package two fifty amp of the yeah the standard package standard pinout let's say. But there was also the easy paralleling pinout. What's the induction on there? Because I couldn't find that. Ah, okay. So the easy paralleling pinout, um, that goes actually to six nanohenry um, stray inductance. So, you know, from six nanohenry to four nanohenry, there is a two nanohenry gain. If that's really important to you, then okay. But I, I don't see that as much a big uh, jump. So I think the, the simplicity of the PCB board really uh, outweighs that two nanohenry increase. Yeah, I would agree to that, I think. Um, Concerning tim printing, another another question: um, What is the premium cost for the tim printing? So that's a sensitive question, but maybe we can give a, a general <laughs> statement. General statement, I like those. Um, I would say from a premium standpoint. So there's there's a couple things to look at here. There's pre-applied thermal paste, 
and then there's the which thermal paste you use. So which thermal paste you use, whether it's the high performance thermal paste or you know the, the standard type that we you know would use in previous years, um, that's about the same. There's virtually no difference in those. So in fact, if you're if you're using a thermal paste, a pre-applied thermal paste especially, I highly, highly, highly recommend going with the high performance thermal paste because you get that um, that re reduced um, thermal resistance without paying anything extra. And then when it comes to the pre-applied versus not applied thermal paste, um, that's a standard process for us uh, at Simicron. And we're talking cents here. It's it's well under a euro. Okay, cool, interesting. So now there, there come some more questions in. Let's see if we can answer all of these. Um, a question about the SSE MOSFET portfolio in, in general, 1700 volt portfolio, 200, 300 amp, and, and 400 amp, actually. I think I can answer that. So the question is, is are these available 1700 volt? And um, I think I know that these are not available in the semi-top, but there is a semi-trans three power module with I think about 200 to 300 amp um, of current rating. So 62 millimeter module where we have a, a fully qualified 1700, 1700 volt SSE MOSFET power module available. And I think we have that, is that with um, the external shot key diode as well that goes with that? With That's that, correct, yeah, yeah, that has an external shot key diode external but external to the mosfet but internal to the module correct right? yeah um but that is available correct um another question do we have driver pcb for these sic ah, modules? that's a good question so i'll say that we have nothing specific for silicon carbide um one possibility is actually um taking the existing driver cores um the silicon carbide has different turn on and turn off voltages so it's a little bit different from igbt's and how and how we we run those. Therefore, you have to have some sort of a level shift in order to um, to turn the silicon carbide on. I think it's 18 volts on, and you're looking for just barely a negative volts off to make sure that you are safely turning on and off. So the driver cores that we have are able to do that as long as the adapters have some ex extra circuitry involved. I think in this case anyway, because it's a, a semi-top E1, E2 package, you would anyway have to do a complete PCB design. So, oh, absolutely, um, yeah. It's not yeah a single PCB per, per yeah. module or anything. That nothing, would be... nothing plug and play yeah. in this case, I would say. Um, a question concerning the uh, charts you show. Now I lost the question. Um, oh, here we go. The efficiency curve that you showed, um, efficiency versus switching frequency, is that for the AC to DC or the DC to DC converters? Those are for the AC to DC converters. Um, and that's one thing that, unfortunately, I didn't um, have DC to DC included in here um, too much. I know this is charging and that's a, that's a big miss. But I'll say if you have more questions about the DC to DC side of this, um, please do email us. Um, maybe that could be a, a future webinar for us as well. Okay, so I would uh, propose we, we close it um, for today. Um, there are one or two questions which I... Uh which we couldn't answer now. But anyway, I told you we will come back to you by email. That's, uh, that's a promise here. So Emilio, thank you very much again. Um, thanks to the audience for joining the webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and you could take away some, some useful information. Get in touch with us if you need more information. As I said, we will answer your remaining questions. And now I would really uh, like to say that we would like to welcome you to the PCIM Digital Days in the first week of May, where we will also have, uh, I think, four presentations and also some conference um, presentations as well. Um, I think registration, at least for the presentations, is for free. So uh, join us at the PCIM Digital Days, and we keep you posted with the new webinars that we are planning after that. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.